Okay, so uh, 4.1 in this chapter, look off to this right-hand side. Uh, when we refer to max and min values, and while that will be brought up repeatedly, uh, when uh, you'll be asked to find the absolute maximum value or the absolute minimum value, please realize we are referring to y values, to the y values. Very, very, very important. Uh, and I just wanted to show you this picture off towards uh, the left. And no doubt about it, you will uh, really need to distinguish between some of these occurrences. You can see on the x-axis down below, I've labeled A, C, E, D, and B. And uh, A and B, of course, is your uh, interval that we are uh, looking at. Uh, today, we're going to focus quite a bit on looking at extrema on closed intervals, where the endpoints are both going to be allowed to be achieved for x to equal them. Uh, but uh, just want to point something out to you. Uh, you can talk about high points, like the top of the mountain, so to speak, as some teachers will refer that to. Uh, you, you could see that, uh, you know, that first uh, little highlight that I made by C. Uh, yeah, it's a, a high point. It's like the top of the mountain, but only in the immediate vicinity of points around it. It's not the highest point all in all. Uh, but uh, that y value that I you know, just highlighted, that would be the biggest y value relative to the y values around it. Uh, so we would call that a relative maximum, a relative maximum. Uh, also, some books would call that a local maximum, a local maximum meaning just in that locality in that immediate region, that would be the highest point. Uh, by way of comparison, take a look at D. D, likewise, is the top of the mountain. But that Y value that you'd see at the very, very top is truly the biggest Y value of all. So we're actually going to call that the absolute maximum. And by the way, we're going to look at absolute extrema quite a bit today. Uh, meaning this is the biggest y value that you'll ever see on that interval. Now, by way of comparison, you could say, well, if you had the highest of the high, couldn't you also have uh, the bottom of the valley, so to speak? Uh, you know, uh, uh, by E, you can see right over here, right over here, this point is the lowest point on the curve relative to the point surrounding it. It's not really the lowest point smallest y value in all of the points shown, but you could see that's like the bottom of the valley. We would refer to that as a relative minimum. Now I do want to show you that at those first three things that I've just drawn in, you could see that it sure looks like we could draw in a horizontal tangent line, and indeed we could. That, that's going to be very, very, very pertinent in just a moment. Uh, but look, if someone were to say, well, what is the smallest y value that you'd ever see? We're seeing that endpoints can definitely come into play. That's another huge part of today's lesson, that we should always check endpoints because endpoints can, and in this case will, uh, have the biggest or the smallest y value in all of the curve. Now, by way of comparison, when you look on the far right edge right here at B, you can say, well, wait a minute. That clearly is not the largest or smallest Y value uh, in the mix. We would just simply refer to that as an endpoint. Okay? So we're just getting some vocabulary down, and, and it's important vocabulary. And, uh, you know, let's go ahead and take a look at example one. An example one, maybe uh, this will really drive home that on this interval from zero to pi over two, well, my goodness, we're going to first maybe graph it. Let's just get this thing graphed. Sine. Sine can always have a smallest y value of what? Negative one, right? And a biggest y value of 
positive one. And, uh, you know, if I were to go all the way out to, to pi over 2, what is happening at the sine of 0? The sine of 0 is 0. But by the way, I'm not allowed to equal that. That's not a closed bracket. And likewise, what's happening at the sine of pi over 2? Sine of pi over 2, we're at 1. Now, if you know your trig graphs, you'd know that a sine wave normally you know, looks like that. It's forever oscillating. Uh, so we're just dealing with a little portion of that. Uh, but they're saying find all absolute extrema. Is there a biggest y value that you could ever achieve on this graph? What y value would that be? Uh, but the problem is you can't equal that. But you see, look at this. At the sine of pi over 2, kids would say that's equal to 1. Am I allowed to plug pi over 2 in? Nope. That's why there's an open circle up there. Do you see the problem? Someone would say, well, the largest y value is a 1. Uh, sorry, you never reach that. You never really reach that. Yes? Correct. If, if we would have had brackets... Uh, you know, that would indicate that x could equal these endpoints. This is really saying that x is exclusively between 0 and pi over 2 without realizing, without achieving the endpoints. What's the answer? There's no absolute extrema. Wow. There is no biggest y value that you could ever read. There is no smallest y value that you could ever achieve. Those open circles kind of rain on our parade. All right. The extreme value theorem. Look, what you want to do is avoid that last example. You need a closed interval. Guys, if you have a continuous function on a closed interval, then f has an absolute minimum. And it has an absolute maximum value at least once. Now that might bother you somewhat. You can say, I don't know. Again, someone can be very thoughtful and say, what about a constant function? What about f of x equals 7? And we're just going to look at the x values between 1 and 3. And kids will say, look at this, Mr. Dobner. Between 1 and 3, you're always going to have y values of 7. You're telling me that there's an absolute biggest y value there? Yes, what is it? 7. And what's the absolute minimum value? 7. Right? That's the, the biggest and the smallest. Right? It's the only y value that you have. So even as you try to come up with some clever trickery to get out of the extreme value theorem, it's uh, take it on good faith. This is true. Now, as long as you've got a closed interval, you've got a continuous function, you will have at least one absolute minimum y value. Uh, you will have an, a singular absolute minimum value, and an absolute maximum value. They uh, very well could be one and the same, like we saw. Here's your theorem. If f does have a local extremum, Hey, all of a sudden, that just means that, you know, relative to its surroundings, uh, it's the largest y value or the smallest, then one of two things has to happen. Either f prime of c at this x value is zero. Hey, that's a horizontal tangent line like we were just seeing right here. Or f prime of c does not exist. Guys, when the derivative doesn't exist, what kind of things do we have here? Corners or cusps? Well, that could definitely occur too, right? You might have a graph where, you know, maybe the derivative doesn't exist, but we're going to have an extremum right there. This seems a little uh, funny. A corollary says that by way of comparison, if your derivative exists, in other words, it's not going to indicate a corner or a cusp, and your derivative is not zero, you can rest assured that f of c is not a local extremum. And then this theorem right here, this seems to be saying so much of the same thing. If f is continuous on a closed interval, so huge, 
and it has a relative that is like a local maximum or a relative minimum value at x equals c, where c is somewhere on this open interval, then one of two things are going to happen. The derivative at c is zero, or the derivative at c does not exist. We're going to be very, very, very interested in finding out where our derivative is zero or where our derivative doesn't exist. It's going to tell us this could be where we've got relative extremum. It could also be, uh, you know, letting us know that that could come from a cusp uh, or a corner as well. Uh, but it's so important that where the derivative is zero or it doesn't exist, that x value is going to be known as a critical number. It's going to be something to investigate. So we're going to flip over to the back. And uh, what you're going to see right now as we plow through this is these are pretty much your homework problems. Uh, they're going to say find the absolute maximum and the absolute minimum values on this interval from negative 4 to 2. And here's what we're always going to do. We're going to take our derivative. We're going to solve. So we'll take a derivative and find where f prime of x equals 0 or where it does not exist. Those will be our critical numbers. Let's get started. What is our derivative? Help me here. Bring down that 3. What do we get? What's the derivative of 2 thirds x cubed? Yeah, 2x squared. And then uh, what's the derivative of a 2x squared? That's a 4x. And then the derivative of a minus 6x is minus 6. And we'd say, well, there's my derivative. Tell you what, let's set it equal to 0. By the way, do we need to worry about the derivative not existing right now? Not in this problem. That's a polynomial. That polynomial, you'll never get your derivative to, to not exist. Uh, but listen, tell you what, how about I divide everything by 2? That's such a friendly way of doing that. And just uh, working that out. And then I'm going to solve, and I'm going to see what's happening here. Uh, does this factor? Yeah. Into what? X plus 3, x minus 1. And uh, if we were to solve, I think very quickly, kids would say, well, here's f of negative, x equals negative 3, x equals positive 1. Do both of those values fit in this interval? Yes. If they don't, you throw it out. You're not looking at anything that's not in the interval. Later on, that will happen. And we'll say, oh, that's not between negative 4 and 2. Don't even worry about it. But both of them are very pertinent. So what do we do? We're going to check what the y value is at negative 3. We're going to check what the y value is at 1. But we're also going to check the endpoints. The left endpoint is x equals negative 4. The right endpoint is x equals 2. Now, tell you what, guys, you could, you are more than welcome to get some help via the calculator. We can type in, you know, with an alpha y equals here. We'll say here's a 2, and I can bring this down here. Here's a 2 thirds. And we'll say here's, now notice I'm typing in the original function right here. I'll say here's a plus 2x squared, and then we'll say a minus a 6x. And uh, what I want to do is plug all these in. So tell you what, I'm actually going to go to, well, you could go to auto or ask. Right now, I'll just go to auto uh, and show you at negative 4, we're going to get 40 thirds. At negative 3, we're going to be at 18. Uh, we're going to have to scroll down a little bit to 1. Well, that's negative 10 thirds. And then at 2, we're going to have 4 thirds. 
Okay, so the video is about to end.